Oh, this is Chicago where, where this, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I always say I'm from Chicago where many are cold but few are frozen. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I think our lowest temperature this winter was 35, negative 35 Fahrenheit. And that's when I start ordering groceries to be delivered. Uh, the newscast will tell women not to wear earrings and jewelry because they will freeze if you're outside. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't enjoy the winters in Chicago. That's why I own a place in Palm Springs, California. And I go away to the desert in the winter when I can. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, good morning. Thank you for being here, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas McKenty. As I said, I'm from Chicago, and uh, I, I'm glad to be here. And uh, we're going to talk about newspapers this morning, newspaper research. I know there's already been one class, I believe, on newspapers. Mine is going to be a little bit different, a little bit different twist on it. Uh, I will get you out of here by 10.15 so you can have a decent coffee break and ready for the 10.30. Uh, so let's get started. Uh before we start, if you do have a mobile device, if you'll put it on silent or vibrate mode, if you'll just check that, please, as a courtesy. Uh, I ask that you not reproduce, uh, especially the handout. There's a very good syllabus in the online syllabus uh, that's for your personal use. I just ask that you not put it out there on the internet. Uh, you can take photos of my slides. That's permissible. I have no problem with that. Also, if you are on social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram. The hashtag is uh, MHLive2018, and that allows MyHeritage to track that, and uh, I take a look at that. Yes, we have some embarrassing party videos from last night. Anyone featured in them? Did you enjoy the party last night? MyHeritage throws a great party at Roots Tech every year. Last This past year, they did a roaring 1920s party. And uh, it was amazing. So they do a great party in Salt Lake City as well. So let's get started. We're going to talk about newspapers. Now, I am coming from a U.S. perspective, and I will tell you that uh, there are more and more foreign language newspapers out there, European papers, Canadian papers, U.K. papers that are coming online. And we're talking mostly online. We all know that not everything can be found online, correct? Uh, it is estimated that 10 percent of records that are of use to genealogists are online. Uh, so you may need to go to an archive or a repository and look at bound newspapers, but the strategies are the same. So, so what is it about old newspapers? I love finding my ancestors in old newspapers. My great-grandparents are listed in the Lowville, New York papers, in the New York City newspapers, in the Bronx, uh, most of my people are from New York, dating back to 1645 with the, the Dutch settlement. And uh, it's great because newspapers, one way that they really help is it's a time capsule of someone at a specific location and a specific date, which we don't get always with a census. We get a census maybe in 1900, 1905, and then we've got to fill in the gaps on those years. So I want to first go through some of the sections that you need to be aware of. Now, all of these resources are available on MyHeritage uh, under the newspapers. There are amazing, I mean, the records there are just absolutely amazing. I'm looking right here, Australian newspapers, there's over, there's almost 15 million records. I think this is one of the more, more underused areas in MyHeritage, to be honest. People think automatically, Oh, I'm going to go to newspapers.com or I'm going to go to Fulton History, one of the free resources. But don't, if you have a subscription, even if you don't, do a search and see what you're going to find on MyHeritage newspapers. So some of the overlooked sections, advertisements or advertisements, as we say in the States. Now, why would you look at advertisements? Well, perhaps your ancestor was a business owner. But also think of the social history. Do you know how much your ancestor paid for a dozen eggs? in 1910. I'm curious, you know, how much was the cost of a house in 1900? You'll get an idea of items for sale from the advertisements. Death notices. Let me see if I have links here. I do have some links on these, so let me go ahead here. And just so you know, I'm going to pull up, and this is just, I'll zoom in on some of these so you get an idea. Uh, is that better for you? 
to see? Great. Uh, this is from an, uh, a newspaper in the 1870s. You know how I can tell the difference? Usually about 1880 is when uh, picture advertising took place. You'll actually see some drawings. Before that, you'll mostly see line ads like this. And this is very typical for New York papers uh, in terms of advertising. In fact, this is my ancestor right here. Ira Austin Jr., that's my third great-grandfather, advertising his harness and saddle business in Lowellville, New York. And this is from, I believe, the 1872 newspaper in Lowellville, New York. Death notices. Now, when I say death notices, I don't mean obituaries. Obituaries are a relatively modern uh, thing where there's more of a narrative. Okay, and there are some crazy obituaries out there. Read Dick Eastman. He always has some good ones. But this is a death notice. And let me go ahead and, and I zoom into all of these so that you get a better idea. I apologize for the quality. Do you notice the scan on this is not very good? Do you notice how sometimes the words are gloppy? The OCR, it can be very difficult on some of these old newspapers. But this is the type of information you get. O'Connor, January 19th, Annie, the wife of Arthur O'Connor, Jr., age 24 years. Funeral today from residence at 156 North Green Street to Northwestern Railroad Depot, thence to Calvary by Cars, which is the cemetery. It was common, this is before funeral homes, bodies were laid out at home. And so that is usually where the funeral would start and either go to the church or house of worship and then to the cemetery. So when you have a death notice, it's basic, it's very basic. It's all factual. What's the one downside of this? We don't know Annie O'Connor's maiden name, her birth name, unfortunately. So great. Let's go over here. Estate sales. This is one that is often overlooked. And this is one of the better ads that I have here. And this one, uh, I believe this is a similar one on my heritage. There are some ads over here, but let me go to this one. It tells you the person, the, de the decedent, is Catherine A. Burke. They are selling items from her residence in Port Leiden. Uh, and I believe that should say, yeah, Port Leiden is New York, Friday, August 25th at 1 p.m. And it tells what the goods are, but look at this down here. Look at how valuable that is. Who is the executor of the estate? It tells it right there in the advertisement. So I know to go to look for court records now that I have the executor. Events listings. This is what I love about some of these small town papers. We may look at them as gossipy, but keep it in perspective. Before in the 1920s and radio, this was entertainment. This is what you did. This is how you kept up with news. There was no radio. There was no television. So it says a farewell party was given at the home of Mrs. Albert A. Cook, uh, blah, blah, blah. And the important thing is, now again, look at Mrs. Barr. It doesn't give you her first name, doesn't give you her maiden name. But the last part is, Mrs. Barr left Sunday for Boonville, where she will make her future home with Mr. and Mrs. John Cavanaugh. So my genealogist thinking is saying, okay, perhaps that's their daughter, and that's the married name, John Cavanaugh, Mrs. John Cavanaugh. Maybe she's retiring and going to live with them. So I'm going to iterate that out. There are always little clues, even in these little event listings. This one is going to kill you. Well, I mean, hospital listings, no. I grew up with this. I grew up. In my hometown newspaper, I was born in 1962, but they would publish who was in the hospital every week. There were no HIPAA laws. There were no medical privacy laws. You have to understand, I, I, I'm a big uh, proponent, uh, and I said this in the DNA, not a proponent, but I, I've studied privacy in the U.S., and I said this in the DNA panel yesterday. Uh, privacy is a 20th century construct. The minute you walked out your door, in the you know turn of the century or before that, your life was public fodder. And the town felt and the city felt they had a right to know who was where. Why would you put in who was in the hospital? Luckily, they don't say, well, not luckily. I'd like to know what they were suffering from, my ancestors. Uh, but the thing is, is they say, you know, 
But in a small town, you need to arrange care for children, care for other people you want to know. Sometimes you'll see a listing saying that they were released from the hospital, so you know someone's home. Maybe they're able to receive visitors. Okay, so this is very common. I hear that there are still some southern uh, states in the U.S. that still have these uh, p published, who's in the hospital. Hotel arrivals, another one that is absolutely crazy. This Now, I don't know about you, but I did not make the Oslo papers when I arrived here on Thursday. They did not say, Thomas McKenty is saying at the Radisson Blue Scandinavia. But look at this. This is 1903. Excuse me, 1903. And I can tell at the Sir William Hotel, John J. Martin from Columbus, Ohio. On this date in 1903, I know where he is and where he's coming from. This is in between census years. It's even in between the state census years. So again, it's that time capsule. Sometimes you'll see that they're traveling with a spouse. Of course, the woman has no first name. It's, you know, Mrs. Smith. But again, hotel arrivals were very common. Uh, even in some of the city papers. I know that on uh, my heritage they have some for uh, Philadelphia and some other cities where the hotel arrivals are just listed there. Understand on the cities it will be more prominent people, but usually on the small towns it will be anyone and everyone. Have you heard of this one? Letters waiting at the post office. Well, think about it. There were no telephones. I mean, the, the postmaster or mistress is not going to call you up and say you have something waiting. This happened mostly at resort towns like Saratoga Springs, New York. Any, I grew up in the Borscht Belt in, in the Catskills, so they would publish these because if you went for the summer, you basically went to the post office general delivery. So this is at Lowellville, May 28th, around the start of the, the, the summer uh, resort time, and these people we knew were expected to be in Lowellville on May 28th. This is golden. Legal notices. This one I'll zoom in because it's a little bit, and again, it does get gloppy here. This is one for my family, uh, Martin Austin. But this is a notice. This is a legal notice. And look at all these names in here. Fanny Wheelock, Alonzo S. Austin, Mina Loomis. So we've got different surnames here. My mother's maiden name was Austin. The Austins go back to Rhode Island in 1628, Robert Austin. Uh, but the thing is, you have to think, why are these people being notified of an, of an estate of Martin Austin or others? Down here, it will give you the, the estate down here. But look at this. Oh, Isaiah Burr, a deceased half-brother of Alva Austin. They're doing genealogy right here in the newspaper column. Okay, legal notices, really go through them. And we'll talk a bit. They're easier to find. I'll show you the way to find them. But they will finally, look at this is a long notice. I even had to cut it off. Uh, but basically, they're looking for anyone related to Alva Austin and that estate. They're trying to settle that estate close some of these windows here. Great. Local news. These are the gossip columns that I was talking about, usually written by a woman. Let me see. I need to really zoom this one. No, not that I'm not saying gossip is just the domain of women, but usually uh, this one's not going to come in too well, and I apologize. Let's see here. But it will say the comings and goings, who's in the hospital. Here's a person has the ends of their fingers cut off, you know, things like that. But again, this was entertainment. This is what, I hate to say it, what people live for. These. Do you know what these are? In the United States, women were chattel. They were considered chattel up until about 1929, 1930. And if a couple had separated, the husband would have to take a notice out in the paper saying he was no longer responsible for his wife's actions or for her behavior. Now, this is from 1815 in upstate New York. It says, notice my wife Elizabeth Witter, having for some time past refused to live with me, I hereby caution all persons having any dealings with her or trusting her on my account. It's common. You'll hear also phrases like, has left the care and comfort of my board and bed. That's a common. So if you put in your ancestor's surname and that phrase, let's see what you get. Now, sometimes, though, the wife will take out an ad the next week. <laughs> so here it is. 
to the public as Ezra Witter, Witter saw fit to post his wife, I think it my duty to let the public know what for. He took other women home who talked very unbecoming, besides using very hard threats towards me. He likewise denied he had any wife, said he had women enough without me, and would not part with them but by reason of the disease which afterwards appeared to his shame. I thought it best for me to stay at my own place. It's sort of like Jerry Springer 1815 style, right? Now, we, yeah, but we, now we may laugh at this, but if you look, think about it. A woman in 1815, if she could prove abandonment or abuse, she could get an accelerated divorce. She also wanted the sympathy of the community because she probably had children to care for. She also is advertising to hook up with another man to take care of her. So you're going to say, why would someone air their dirty laundry? But in a way, there is a reason behind this, you know. There's actually a good book out there where a woman has documented 400 of these back and forth advertisements. Some are done in poetry, some are done in song, and it's really kind of funny. But again, this is something that was commonplace in the newspapers. Memorials. <clears throat> now, I want to point out what memorials are versus death notices. A memorial is an anniversary of a death. So look at this first one. In memory of our darling daughter who died August 7th, 1927. And down it says, Mr. and Mrs. Benjamin Martin and family. What's missing? The name of the daughter. I mean, you know, that's really not a lot of help, but then I'll go back and maybe look for a death record. Down here, in loving memory of our da dear daughter and sister, Evelyn Snyder, who left us three years ago, August 10th, 1926. Uh, so you get things like that. So usually memorials will dedicate uh, a death in the past. Great. Obituaries. This is the obituary for my third great-grandmother. Uh, and she was born in 1837. I still have her wedding silver handmade in 1857 in upstate New York. Uh, and she was she died in 1937. Uh, 1927, so she's 90 years old, 91 years old. But again, it will tell you where the funeral was from. Uh, it will say where she was born. Uh, and then the sister, and again, a deficiency here is Mrs. Margaret O'Neill of this village, okay, uh, so a sister. So we know Margaret's maiden name was probably not O'Keefe, it was Sullivan. Up here, we should know, right here, Catherine's maiden name was Sullivan. So, exactly. And it will tell you where these people are, which is great. Down here it closes. It says, a sister, Mrs. Elizabeth Conway, 83, died in this village about a month ago. So I'm going to go back to that issue and look for information on the death of her sister. Personals. It's not sex ads. Okay, personals in the old newspapers basically were a catch-all. And uh, let me see if I've got here. Great. And it was a catch-all. Sometimes you do see psychic ads. You'll say that, you know, Mrs. Rosa is over at the Lowville Hotel taking clients this week. Uh, but here, Mrs. Wallace Orndorff is visiting her daughters at Albany and Kingston. So someone would call up and want this inserted in the personals because it wasn't picked up in the local news. But a lot of times they will be some advertisements that people are in town uh, you know, someone has set up shop, the Fuller Brush Man is in town or something like that. But that's what personals are. It's a catch-all. It's not what we think of as personals today. School news. Yes. Uh, I have many of my relatives. In fact, my father is listed in the honor list <clears throat> back home. <clears throat> this is from Lake Placid, New York. But this will tell you uh, who made the honor roll. Uh, my newspaper, when I was in high school, published my homeroom. That's how I knew what my homeroom was going into school in the fall. So uh, different athletic awards, everything you can find in the newspapers usually. The shipping news. Now, I can't enlarge this. I apologize. But this is what the shipping news was. Uh, in the United States, most of our passenger lists are for ocean ports only, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, uh, and New Orleans. What about the Great Lakes? What about the Ohio River? That's where you'll find information in the shipping news. The shipping news will tell you what boats have arrived, 
what they were carrying <clears throat> in terms of cargo, who they were carrying, and where they're they, <clears throat> excuse me, where they are going to. I think I party too much last night, Gilad. So, okay. So, do we understand some of the basic areas? Now, they're consistent with most papers. Foreign papers may have some different uh, sections. But what are the research strategies using the MyHeritage collection? Well, first, my biggest recommendation is you want to search broad, and then you want to narrow it down. Don't go too narrow, okay? So go ahead and put in your surname, put in a location. There are some great filters. I've got a lot of things open here, and I should probably close them before I break the hotel's internet, right? Uh, but here, I mean, we've got a lot of great filters. We can go by publication title, publication date, place, and the keywords. I love this down here. It says exact search and with translations, which is a great MyHeritage feature. Uh, I would not use exact search. Remember, that's a little bit too narrow. You want to go first broad and then narrow it down and then maybe go with exact search. But I'll tell you in a minute why you don't want to do exact search. It's mostly because of this. I've read the statistics. OCR, do you know what OCR stands for? Optical Character Recognition. So when you scan a newspaper, you're creating an image. Then you have to scan it to have searchable text. So there's a process that goes through, and it's called OCR. Now, OCR is only about 80% reliable on historical newspapers. Those are the figures that I've located. So you want to take that into account. And what do I mean by patterns and mistakes? On a page, I can tell that, oh, the A always looks like the O. That's how it reads it. So, in fact, when you look at an article on MyHeritage, go down below and it will tell you that it will show you the text that was scanned. And it is messy. And you can tell what the OCR patterns are. So you get to know the pattern for that page and then you make allowances when you do your searching. Hyphenated words can be, oops, hyphenated words can be a problem. Oops, I'm sorry here. I keep going too far ahead. Apologize. There we go. Hyphenation can be a problem. My name, McKenty, guess what I found? It was listed as M-A-C-E-N hyphen T-E-E -E on the next line. But the problem with OCR, it reads the hyphen as a hard character. So if I'm searching for McKenty, I would, I would not have been able to find my birth announcement in my hometown newspaper because my name was hyphenated at the end of the line. So you have to make allowances for that. Understand how hyphenation works and make allowances for that. Diacritic characters can be difficult as well. Some databases allow you to search for diacritic characters. Most databases and most sites, you just put it in without the diacritic characters. But you have to know what the rules are of the database, of the search. Sometimes those are difficult to find. Uh, but again, you need to be flexible in your search rationale. And again, as we said, especially on MyHeritage, use date range, data ranges and other filters, filter by date, filter by location, uh, and then you're going to be able to pinpoint those papers that you need. Any questions so far? I can take questions intermittently if I repeat them. Uh, but yes, question. Can I use uh, wild cards? Yes. So the question is, can I use wild cards when searching? And the, que the answer is yes. And we know what the wild cards are. Let me go ahead and pull up a Word document here and uh, pull up and, and do this in a large font. Uh, there we go. So basically, if I want to, for my name, I can do M-A-C. Let me do this in a larger font so you can see it like that. There. I could do M-A-C asterisk, and that would say anything after M-A-C, okay? Or I could do even like this, M-A-C-E-N asterisk. So I would get T-E-E, -E, tree. I'm always called McKen tree, and T-R-Y, T-R-E-E, -E, so I would allow for that. Here's another variation. What if I were to do this? If you want one character, you do a question mark. 
Question mark is the wild card usually universally for one character. So maybe it's M-I-C, maybe it's M-E-C, okay? Or I could even do this. I could do M wild card NT, so I don't know if it's a Mac or a Mick. Okay, so play with those wild cards. That's a great question, sir. I'm glad you brought that up. But play with those wild card features if you're not finding. Yes, ma'am. What does wild card mean is, I'm not certain. So a wild card means that it could be anything. You know how a wild card, when you're playing cards, not that I would know, it matches anything, right? It matches. So the thing is, what pattern would this match? Well, it could match anything. I know the stem, E-N-T-E-E, -E, for sure. And I was told it starts with M. But maybe I'm not certain on the in-between. Here's another one here. Is uh, I could do, uh, if it was Holberg, you know, I could do something like this. Maybe there it was Holberger. Okay, maybe there's an ending there. Maybe I don't know what the middle character is. So I can do either... Uh, hyphen, I can do either question mark or asterisk. So it's a way of doing that. Yes? Question mark is one character only. Uh, I think it's safer to use the asterisk, okay? You have to be pretty certain that you're only looking for a match on one character with, you know, with the question mark. I personally recommend that you use the asterisk for anything. Yes, sir. Yes, exactly. Thank you for pointing that out. So what he's saying is some resources like Ancestry, you can't do this. You can't just do H asterisk. It needs a minimum of three characters to function to do the search. Thank you for pointing that out. Right. Well, and it's, it's, yeah, sometimes there's an FAQ, frequently asked questions for a database. Sometimes I've been known to go to the community forum or the message board. And that's a great way. You know what? Facebook is also where we do queries, and we I get answers on Facebook all the time. You know, go to go to MyHeritage, uh, go to the page for customer service, and say, you know, and, and you will get an answer. Uh, and that's what I do, you know, because it is very hard to figure out how it works. But I know the ancestry rule is three-character minimum. In, there's not a way to fool it that I know. That I know of, no, no, that I know of. You had a question, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So her question, yeah, her question is in terms of those sections, which we're going to go over again. Uh, are they more helpful for online or, or hard copy? The online is important, too, because what I'll tell you is most papers have a formula. Legal notices will always be on page 7 for a certain newspaper. So if I'm browsing newspapers online, I know, oh, I'm not going to go through pages 1 through 6 on this week's issue. I'm going to hop to number 7. Sometimes because of the way OCR works with only an 80% success rate, I'm going to actually flip pages and read through. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, it, and that's what the OCR is. When I'm looking at a specific article, and, and my heritage newspapers is great about this because when you do do a search, it will appear uh, down here when you find it. It'll say, it'll say what the TXT file is, and the TXT file looks sometimes a lot of gibberish. You have to understand that we're working with old papers, sometimes depending on who has scanned it. Uh, it may have been a rapid scan. Sometimes I'll find gaps. Sometimes the paper is just so old and the print is so thick that the OCR can't read it. So let me move on to make sure that I'm on track here. So again, what are we going to extract here on advertisements? We're going to look for ancestor names. We're going to look for prices that would be part of our social history for our ancestors. Death notices. 
the typical death information. You're going to look for those clues. Uh, but you're also, you're going to get an address sometimes, the home address. That can be very valuable when you're doing research. Where did the family live? It might give you an address that's different than the address on the census or even the address in a city directory. So that, those are the valuable parts. Who were the family, uh, who, who was the person that died, and where did they die? Estate sales. One of the most valuable here is besides the name of the deceased, which this is not very frequent. Most estate sales will just, you know, just say an estate sale. But the executor is very valuable down there. The event listings, these look like fluff and gossip, but still, uh, see here, why was there a party? So it was a going away party. I see that they played Euchre. Does anyone know what Euchre is? It's very popular in Michigan in the Midwest. It's a card game. And uh, so, but the thing is, uh, and, Mrs. Ma and Mrs. Peter McGovern weren't, won the party favor, uh, but uh, it tells you that Mrs. Barr left to go live with Mr. and Mrs. John Cavanaugh. So that's something that I want to pursue. So it tells you the coming and goings. Hospital listings. So you know where someone is uh, and that maybe they were sick. Maybe they were sick leading up to a death uh, and for that reason. Hotel arrivals, again, pinpoints them with accuracy where they were. Now these are expected. This is not a confirmation that they actually arrived. This is what was expected from the reservations that were on hand. Advertise, yes, question. Yes, yeah, so the question is, uh, unless the relative, you knew the relative was visiting that city, how would you know? You wouldn't, but this is why you would do a surname search. Yeah, so I would do a surname, I would do maybe co, C-O-E, I could use, uh, so on this one on the letters, I could do COE, I could do post office with COE with the surname, and I could give it a date and do it that way. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there we go, microphone, thank you. Uh, where, where can you look for what, what happened to them when they uh, when started they, in yeah. the beginning? Yeah, when they emigrated, so the question is when someone arrived when they emigrated, how could you find out? Now, they necessarily wouldn't necessarily have mail waiting for them. In the United States, we use passenger lists. The passenger list will tell you when they arrived, but the best part is this, who sponsored them and what address are they going to? So passenger lists and passenger lists, there's great resources on MyHeritage for passenger lists. One more and then I'll move on. Yes. Hold on. Wait for the mic. Yeah. Um, the hotel list could probably be dangerous because what if Mr. So-and-so was at a hotel and it wasn't Mr. So-and-so? That Ex could give you... Exactly. If he had a it's, mistress yeah. <laughs> and he was at a hotel, yes. It was not, wasn't always... Uh, maybe it was a monkey business trip and not just a business trip. Right. So exactly. Yeah. So let me move on here. Legal notices, this has so much information. This has, there are so many names, but the thing that you need to think of, you're gonna see many different surnames that you may not recognize. There's a connection. Why are these people being notified? That's what you need to think of. Local news, again, those gossip columns, but comings and goings, and you get an idea. This is how I learned how my great-grandparents met. It was at a church function, and they were teenagers. And it was through one of these columns that, that I found that out. The Merrill Discord ads, well, you know that there was a breakup. And uh, so you know that something was going on uh, there again. Uh, memorials. Memorials will not give you, uh, sometimes they give you the original death date. Sometimes they're missing information. But you know that something happened three years ago, five years ago. Obituaries, those are more of a narrative, uh, have much more information. Uh, they're not as short as the death notices. Personals, remember personals are a catch-all category. It's, it's anything and everything. School news, you'll find your ancestor's name. Now, most of my ancestors only completed up to the eighth grade, which is in U.S. is, is basic education. Uh, but again, anything in elementary, first school, and second school would be listed here. The shipping news, passengers, mostly passengers that are inland waterways, Erie Canal, 
Ohio River for the U.S. So it's not the seaport. Seaports, passenger lists are better. Now, one thing people ask me, how am I going to get this image of this newspaper? So my best advice is to right click and save. That's what I did with these MyHeritage images for newspapers. I always recommend that you save a copy of the image to your computer's hard drive. You never know when a license is going to expire on a database. Okay, it's just a safeguard. Okay, before, so before, so I'm right clicking and I'm saying save image as, and a lot of the images on my heritage newspapers come in JPEG, which is fine, and I save the JPEG. Sometimes you have to save it as a PDF on other, on other databases, but always save an image so that you have a copy. Yes, ma'am. Train passengers. Uh, train passengers, th those I've not found listings on train passengers, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Unless it was someone of some notoriety, you know, uh, maybe a performer or a celebrity. Yeah. Print screen is not your friend for newspapers. Usually print screen, you can't capture that inner area or that highlight that you need. So I really don't recommend doing print screen and then pasting into something like Microsoft Photo Editor. Get creative. If you're using Evernote or Pinterest, they both have ways of capturing images, okay? Evernote will let you clip, and it will clip an area that you want and save it to Evernote. Evernote is a free program, evernote.com. It's in the resource list on the syllabus. Also, Pinterest. Pinterest will take an image capture if you're not able to do it yourself. This one is really important. Now, how many times have you received maybe a clipping on an index card from a family member? And what's the problem? No date, no origination of the newspaper. And I, so I found that when I started doing genealogy, I was doing the same thing electronically or online. I was clipping this local death record and not making a notation of what the date was and what the paper was. So what I do now is I always save the full page of the paper, then I save a second copy that I crop out what I want. And then I'll make a notation in my records or in the metadata for the file and I'll go ahead and say this is where it's from. So here are some tips and tricks on newspaper research, and then we'll close with questions. Don't rely on OCR indexing. Now, this, I'm not dissing the work that MyHeritage does because I don't think this is MyHeritage's fault, but this is a recent scan. This is something I found on MyHeritage, not the Women's Christian Temperance Union, but look at these gaps. That's the way it was scanned. Okay, so, and the reason I know this, because I went through all 10 pages of this issue, and those blotted areas were pretty much consistent. So something could have been on the glass, on the scanner, which is more likely what happened. Okay, so there, so this is, this is something that's, that you're going to have to deal with, and it's not just my heritage, it's all of the vendors. Anywhere that you find online newspapers, you'll see this to a degree. I even saw one scan, not at my heritage. I don't want Galad to get upset here, but I did see one scan where the scanner had left his sandwich in the corner. <laughs> and I, I found that they had scanned their sandwich for some reason. They must have put it right on the plate there. So, yeah. Okay. So, this is one that's interesting. This is my hometown newspaper. Every week, they did something called Down the Decades. So they would say happened 25 years ago or 50 years ago. So this tells me, oh, so someone, they were celebrating a 25th wedding anniversary. I'm going to go 25 years back and look at that issue of the newspaper. Sometimes this is the only way I can find an event is this whole trip down memory lane. And this is fairly common as for U.S. papers to do this, especially small papers. Okay. Understand the historical vocabulary, okay? So in the 1920s, you'll see the phrase bee's knees. In the 1940s, swell. 
in the 1970s far out. Uh, do you ever think about what, at least in the U.S., we used to call money? I grew up in the 70s. It was called bread. That was the common word. Do you have any bread? Okay. So the thing is, there is going to be local vernacular and vocabulary that you just need to understand. A tuberculosis was called consumption. Okay. So you have to look at the time period and what they were calling things. Now, in the resource list, I also have a list of old time occupation names, a list of old archaic medical terms like black squirrel flu. I didn't know there was such a thing. Uh, and so, so that's important when you're doing these searches. You can't use modern terms sometimes. The other one is, have you ever noticed, at least in English, how first names are abbreviated? Did you know my name, Thomas, is sometimes T-H-O period? I have to search for that. T-H-O-S period. I have to search for that. Did you have a question or not? You're just stretching, right? Okay, yeah, great. Uh, not, oh, right here, yes, question. Yes. Well, uh, so the question is, how do you get the resource list? I believe this, this is the syllabus that I prepared for my heritage. I don't know uh, what the means are for getting this to people. I know that I handed this in to Daniel. Uh, but if you want, I have business cards up here. Take my business card, and I will email this to you in Word or PDF, okay? That's my promise. But I did prepare this, and this is, this is five pages. And it's got a great resource list back here. And look at the resources. Uh, glossary of archaic medical terms, abbreviations, spelling substitute tables, street name, name changes. This is something I never thought about. Streets change names. So if I'm looking for one street, uh, I may not find it. And also there's a free webinar that actually uh, Daniel Horowitz did last month on, his, on newspapers for my heritage. So I have a link in there. So please take a business card on your way out. That's great. Let me just finish this. Not all newspapers are online. They're not. You're going to have to go. These are bound volumes on newspapers. So this is where it helps to know the sections. Usually in a newspaper, death notices will always be on the same page week after week. There was a formula, a template. Instead of how the New York Times says uh, all the news that's fit to print, it's more like all the news that's, that's fit, no, print to fit, fit to print, yeah, back and forth, yes. Take name changes into consideration. Understand that layout formula. What section, where. Don't forget, and this is the last one, point of origin newspapers. For migration in the U.S., we had a big migration out west during the gold rush in the 1850s. What would happen is these people that arrived in California would write back to the Boston and New York newspapers saying, we arrived, this was an account of our journey. And very often the editor would just put that letter right in the paper. So go and so if you have a California or a westward ancestor, remember, search for the papers where they came from. So if I'm doing Minnesota, I might want to go and start to look at Norwegian papers, knowing that they came from Norway, and, and want to use those resources.